Right. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's Africa Arena panel discussion and pitch session. I am super excited. We have some incredible minds who are going to be discussing some amazing things. And we've got awesome startups who are going to be doing a very quick pitch in four minutes. So we've got a hang of a lot to get through. And so let's kick things off. I just want to say bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. To our Swahili brothers and sisters, how did anyone from Nigeria and the rest of the continent? How's everyone going? I hope you're having a awesome Wednesday. It is very cold in Cape Town, but um, grateful to be here. So today is titled the Open Innovation Challenge, and it's in partnership with BPI France. The theme of which is all about how to expand business from Africa to Europe, and what are the opportunities and what are the challenges. And so first up, a massive thank you to our partners, BPI, for enabling this challenge to happen. We are super grateful and we're super excited to see how it develops. And shortly, I will hand over to Christophe, the founder of Africa Arena, and uh, Isabelle, the directrice des Affaires Internationales et Européennes chez BPI France. Bonjour, ma. welcome, bienvenue. And together, they will unpack the partnership and challenge set by BPI. So, Isabelle, Christophe, over to you guys. Thank you, Patrick, and uh, welcome everyone from uh, a very windy and, and rainy Cape Town today. Um, so we are thrilled to have you today for this uh, first uh, online uh, pitch session uh, and uh, panel discussion around uh, scaling in Africa. So just a few words about Africa Arena. Um, Africa Arena is a, a deal uh, flow platform. Uh, we've been operating since 2017 as uh, the premier deal flow um, platform on the continent. So our job is to match the best tech entrepreneurs from the continent with uh, market opportunity uh, alongside a number of open innovation challenge endorsed by about a dozen corporates and with investors, whether they're angel, VC, uh, or other forms of investors. Um, so you can check more information on africana.com. Incidentally, we have released this year for the first time our um, State of the Tech Innovation in Africa report, which is available uh, on the website, uh, which is a very comprehensive report on the state of uh, investment in tech startup in the continent. So I invite you to have a look at that if you haven't checked it out already. Uh, it's a great resource for everyone. Uh, true to our mission, one of the key indicators of, of what we try to deliver uh, is the deals that have been achieved by startups that went through the Africa Arena program. So, you know, we select startups through an Africa Arena tool, which visits uh, the main tech hub of the continent. Um, we've traveled thousands of miles, have met uh, thousands of startups, so um, over 3,000 over the last three years. And uh, they'll start a pitch on the tour. So today this tour is virtual. So we are running an Africa Arena tour event virtually thanks to COVID-19. Uh, and then we get the top 100 startups to fly to Cape Town and take part in a number of uh, sessions and pitch in front of investors and corporates. To date, Africa INI alumni, so startups who have pitched at an Africa INI event, have, and that's the number today, raised $163 million in the past three years. So I think that's really a testament to what we're trying to achieve with Africa INI, which is uh, to create some real deal flow opportunity, both for investors and for entrepreneurs. And we wouldn't be able to do that without, without BPI France. BPI France has been one of our very first partner um, since 2017. They were there from almost the first day. And the partnership with BPI France has, is a number, has, covers a number of areas. Firstly, we are uh, partnering with the Euroquity platform which is one of the top uh, investment platform in the world. It has uh, thousands of investors um, looking at tens of thousands of, of startups and, 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 and companies and investment opportunities. Um, and it's a great platform. So we are animating a community uh, on Euroquity, which you know, is, is growing by the day and on which we can just uh, meet investors virtually. So I encourage you to check out uh, on Euroquity.com, the Africa Arena co uh, community, and, and look at all the opportunities out there. The other aspect of a partnership is that we cooperate on content, on uh, initiatives to foster innovation and investment on the continent. And, um, you know, today we have a great panel with fantastic speakers. I have to thank all of them for being here today. And uh, BPI France is one of our most strategic partners. We work with many, many other partners. I'm not going to name them all. You can see on the 
slides here all the corporates that are that are working with us uh, from many different uh, areas of the world and uh, uh, we have a, over 150 investors that are also partners and many incubators and accelerators and of course media so i hope you enjoy today's event thank you isabel uh, i'm ending over to you and you're going to talk to us about uh, bpi france um, over to you isabel Thank you. Merci, Christophe. Uh, bonjour à tous. J'espère que vous allez bien. I'm happy to be, to be here and to, to in, introduce this first uh, BPI France Challenge by Africa Arena. First of all, of course, I would like to thank Africa Arena, Christophe Vierneau and his team. Uh, we've been working together now for quite a long time. And we really appreciate the, the job you do for tech and financing startups in, uh, in Africa. Thank you all for being present and especially to our panelists uh, who are honoring her with uh, their friendship and, um, and presence. Thank you. I'm just going to, to tell you a few words about BPI France. Um, we have been created in a, we were created in 2013 and since um, this date, um, BPI France has become the one-stop shop for French entrepreneurs um, with a um, vastly comprehensive toolbox proposed to entrepreneurs to finance uh, their company and to accompany them from startups to mid-caps and uh, large companies, but public ones. Um, 3.2 billion euros have been invested in uh, uh, 2019, half of which in technology. We are also, of course, more and more supporting French companies to go international and uh, particularly in Africa. So uh, for that, we have the three main activities in Africa. Uh, we, uh, we have the export credit products, so we are able to lend money to uh, African uh, companies, African uh, institutions, public or private, uh, when they want to buy uh, French products or French uh, services. We also have an activity of um, investor because uh, um, since uh, 2001, uh, we have been investing in, uh, in private equity funds in Africa. We began in North Africa and now we, we, we invest everywhere from North to South, East to, to East in private equity funds and in venture funds. And last uh, but not least, um, we uh, develop um, a, a Euroquity uh, in Africa. Euroquity, what, 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 what is it? It is a matchmaking platform created by BPI France in partnership with KFW in Germany and uh, Sowalfin in Belgium. And it has become the leading European digital service to connect entrepreneurs, corporate, uh, VC and business support organization. Eurocriti is a place where innovative companies uh, gain visibility and are able to get in touch uh, with investors and other companies uh, in Europe and now in Africa. So we have more than uh, 12,000 companies and 1,900 investors on, uh, on Eurocriti. Uh, more than 1,500 companies have been founded for more than 500 million euros. So now Eurocriti uh, is expanding in, in Africa to connect African and, Euro and European ecosystems, companies and investors. And we, <clears throat> we believe that it will create many opportunities to, uh, for the companies of, uh, of both continents. So we began with the first partnership with Atijari Wafa Bank. They have a, a dynamic community uh, with um, on Eurocruity with uh, 1,600 members. And now we are in the process to deploy um, the, the service in Tunisia and, and Senegal with the local leading organization. We have also two communities uh, that will operate at a global level for the continent. The Averroes Africa uh, community for the companies invested by the VCs that, that uh, are uh, our partners. And also, we are also, uh, uh, of course, we are proud also to welcome the Africa Arena community on, on Europe. So, um, this BPI France challenge uh, today is to give visibility to African high potential companies 
that will also uh, develop their business in France and, and in Europe. And we are very happy to join this first session today and discover the companies that um, were selected for the session. Thank you very much. Great, merci Isabel. Thank you, Christophe, really appreciate it. Um, it's so great to see the partnerships that have been developed over with Africa Reno over the last few years. And um, as I've mentioned, normally we would be doing this across the, the continent, but obviously with COVID, we are doing it online. So thank you to all of us for adapting with us and BPI for making it possible. Right, before we kick off, because we've got an amazing lineup uh, for you, I just wanted to run you through how the, today's uh, events will go and just share some house rules and of course introduce our incredible lineup of panelists who have graciously given their time to us uh, and to share their ideas and perspectives on what you're about to hear today. Um, today's session will be broken out into two main sections. First, we will have obviously the panel discussion with our guests, followed by a short Q&A, and then we will jump straight into the pitches. After each pitch, uh, we will have a four minute Q&A for the panelists to ask them one killer question. So panelists, please prep one killer question um, and to get ready. And the founders, please make sure you have uh, an answer as concisely as possible to ensure your point is not cut off because we will be running a timer and to make sure that it is fair and on time with everyone. So let's get started. Thank you. We see lots of you guys are tuning in from all over the world. So thank you so much to everyone from, we've got people from Cape Town, South Africa, Senegal, Dakar, Paris, bonjour. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. We're super grateful to have you guys. Um, okay, first up and definitely we have Cedric Atanga, who is Cameroonian. He is the CEO and co-founder of WeCashUp, a pan-African payment platform that enables businesses to collect and disperse payments online and offline in 36 African countries. Cedric is an industrial engineer and computer scientist at heart, and he graduated with, um, from Polytech Marseille in France. Bonjour, Cedric. Bienvenue aujourd'hui. Merci beaucoup. Uh, it's great to see you. Great to meet you. And uh, thank you for much, so much for giving your time. Then next up, we have Elodie Dussouf, who is the Senior Investment Director at uh, BPI France. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Elodie. It's great to see you. I think she's somewhere here. She'll join us now. We have seen her earlier. And next up, we have uh, Fatima Tu uh, Osmanu, is, and after working at Orange Africa Middle Eastern team, uh, where she was a coordinator of social venture prize in Africa. Um, Fatima Tu joined a Bond Innov uh, Incubator, where she has taken over the reins as the Incubator Communication and Partnership Manager, overseeing the activities, uh, promotion of startups, and of course, creation of opportunities and networking. Thank you so much for joining us today. Great to see you. Love the earrings. They are awesome. And then and we have Khalid Ben Jilani. Um, Khalid is the senior partner and member of the XCOM or African Best, where he oversees the innovation financial sector team. Since joining African Best in 2001, um, Khalid has left and involved in structuring the fundraising and management of three investment funds and has overseen over 30 investments across Africa in innovative companies and financial institutions. He's also a startup ecosystem activated, uh, activist and that is activated for simpler regulations and laws for startups and has helped governments draft startup and VC friendly laws and regulations. Uh, he's also an angel investor. So thank you also so much for your work in that area and we look forward to unpacking some of that today. So I thought, guys, true to the theme, um, we're just talking about what are the opportunities, what are the challenges. I thought if I could run through each of you, Cedric, we'll start with you. What is, in your perspective, current state, and obviously, you know, COVID aside, what is one opportunity and maybe uh, one challenge that uh, startups, African startups currently face in bridging the gap to Europe, specifically France? Yeah, thank you so much for for giving me the stage. Uh, it's a real uh, pleasure to be to be here with you guys. Uh, thank you, Christophe, Africa Arena, BPI France, and all and all of you guys. Thank you for joining us from all over the world. I'm Cedric Atanganasi, and co-founder of WeCashRub, which is a Pan-African uh, payment gateway. Uh, you know, the African market is fragmented geographically. We have 1.3 billion people uh, on our continent today, so it's a very huge market. Uh, when you look at China, for example, is 1.4 billion people. But uh, the thing is, China is uh, um, one country, one you know, one regulation, one language, one currency, one everything. So it's a very unified market. But when you when you look at Africa, uh, we are 1.3 billion people, but 54 countries, more than 42 uh, central banks, 
uh, 42 currencies, uh, more than 155 local uh, payment solutions that, that are running isolated one from another. So uh, the vision that we carry with We Cash App is really to, to, to bring the African continent uh, look like one unified market, one, one accessible uh, market, so that a company based in, uh, out of, uh, of, of Cape Town or Douala or Dakar can, can launch its business uh, online and already tap into the 1.4 billion people that we are in Africa and then maybe extend uh, uh, to, to, to Europe where we have in the European Union uh, more than five, 500 million people, which is becoming close to 2 billion people market when we, when we combine Africa and, 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 and Europe. So um, one, of, one, of, one of the key, uh, the key opportunity that, that, that I see for African uh, uh, companies uh, that, are, that are willing to, to extend to Europe is that uh, the, the European market is uh, is a kind of uh, uh, unified. We, we we have uh, we have France and many other countries that are you know every single country has its own realities. But in general, uh, what works in France generally works in 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 Germany, for example. So th th this is one one of the things that we don't have yet in Africa, which is an, a big opportunity for for an African company that would like to uh, to tap into the European uh, um, market. Um, uh, and now, one of the challenges uh, that, that, that I see, that, that I've experienced as an African entrepreneur uh, doing business uh, uh, that, that I've started in, in, in Africa and now that is running in, in Europe, uh, uh, is that you know, when, when you move uh, from Africa to Europe, there's a lot of st standards that, that, that you need to, to, to meet. For example, we are in payments. Um, uh, for us today to, to operate in Africa, uh, we, we, we need to go we need to set up a lot of uh, um, uh, you know processes to to make sure that the people are using our technology to collect all these best payments on on, on the continent uh, are um, uh, risk free so they, they they are not associated to any kind of fraud etc so moving to europe is is is, is really good because everything is already online and you have apis to check if a company uh, exists company is linked to any uh, you know you have Big databases where you can you can check you can screen the companies, but in Africa we, we have we, we don't have such a, such, a, such a database where you can check screen the companies etc. So uh, on our own experience, while building with Cash Up, we we already built around five to six sub startups inside our startups because we we, we needed to, to to bridge the gap to make sure that. We are able to screen a company based in Douala. So if a company sign up on WeCash, how do we make sure that that company really exists and that that, that company is not is not linked to any kind of fraud? But in in Europe, it's already easy. So uh, doing business is in in Europe would be much more easy for a resilient African uh, startup. So that's that's my point on on, on that. And, and I thank you for, for giving me that support. Thanks, Cedric. Um, Elodie, I want to, and guys, if we could just try and keep, because we've got a lot of uh, opinions and I really want to dive into the brains of each of you um, and give as much value to the audience as possible. So let's try to keep the uh, answers. <laughs> Cedric, that was great and in depth, but let's just try to keep it a little shorter so everyone can, can dive into a bit more. Um, Elodie, let's, let's now, we've gone from, from a startup perspective, in your perspective and the role that you play uh, managing investments, what do you see is a key challenge and what do you see as a, as a key opportunity? Um, sure, so I'll try to keep it as short as, as possible. Uh, first, I just wanted to, to, to say as an introduction that um, um, uh, my, my activity within BPI France, investing in, uh, in African private equity funds, um, is, is, is based on the, on the business links, aside the, the positive uh, impact that we can have on, in Africa, that we can create between African and, and, and French and, and European companies. This is really at the art of our, of our investment positioning. Um, then in terms of, uh, of opportunities, I think uh, we've started investing in, in, uh, in African venture funds uh, in 2015. We've been very impressed by, by the, um, the, the innovation uh, capacity of, of, uh, of African startups to, to adapt to, to, to African different ways of, of uh, consuming products. And, and given Africa is, is such a huge uh, market, I mean, composed of very different markets, um, uh, I, we believe that uh, some of the, 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 the newly customized uh, products that have been developed in Africa could uh, at some point con conquer the, the, the rest of the world, including France and, and, and Europe. And in terms of challenges, of course, uh, uh, financing, getting rounds uh, down, 
uh, getting enough cash uh, uh, to, 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 to finance this kind of expansion is, is, really, uh, is really key. And we see it right now because of the COVID-19 uh, impact that cash can, can run short very quickly. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I want to jump to you, Fatima, too. And if you could kind of share your perspective on what you believe one challenge, one opportunity um, taken from LOD. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, hi, I'm Fatima Tu. I work in Bondina. She's an association who supports startups. We came from Africa and in France. We are based in France. Uh, for me, one of the biggest challenge for an entrepreneur who came from, from Africa and who wants to develop his um, business in France is to um, get the network, you know, to be a part of the ecosystem and to really uh, be connect to the the ecosystem in France and also to analyze really how the market works in French also because it's not only about uh, extending a product or extending a business in France but it's adapting the business with the reality of the of the of the continent and of the country also and uh, one other challenge is that our entrepreneurs in Bondina who came from Africa uh, are phase two is about all of the administration things and tool and all about uh, you know the visa, etc. How where they are going to put whether they want to have an office, uh, how BPAs works because it's me. It's like it's easy, but it's really uh, difficult sometimes for the entrepreneurs. Mm. So they really need to be supported by uh, incubators and uh, and uh, structure like that. Awesome, thank you, Fatima. So that's super interesting. Um, thank you for that insight, uh, Khali. Over to you, and let's maybe dive into your background around regulations and, and working closely with government. What have you noticed, and, and maybe it's something that speaks to both startups and corporates, how could they work together to make some of that red tape a bit easier to get, get through? I mean, from, from, from the challenges standpoint, there are, there are many challenges for an African company to go, to go into Africa. And the, the very first step, which is creating an affiliate in Africa, in, in Europe, is not a simple one. Uh, the, the, mm. the main challenge there, or the main hurdle, is really the access to the European financial system. So opening a bank account, to say it in, a, in, a, in simple terms, is, uh, is really complicated for an African company. The best bridge that you can actually build, what I'm going to say is, is maybe, uh, may, 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 may sound ridiculous, but the best bridge is, is opening a, a, a top holding company in the US. You'd be much more welcome in Europe being a US company than being an African company. I'm not kidding. This is, this is, this is a reality. So imagine mm. a Nigerian company opening in, 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 in Europe. You'll have hundreds of questions from your, any bank saying basically what a company to do here. While these US, US company in technology, fine, even if you have an affiliate in, in some African country. So that's the very first challenge. I think something that has to be, to be, to be, to be solved, meaning if that link and it needs to be not a bridge, but really a, a, a funnel of companies, because there are so many cross opportunities between, between the two continents that these compliance issues really have to be uh, solved, maybe by create, creating some kind of safe heaven where African companies can be can can can, can land. And I think this is one of the objectives of, um, of uh, for instance, the French tech community that have been created across uh, across Africa by by, uh, by by the French government, and they need to play that that uh, that uh, that role. Um, from an opportunity standpoint, there are many. I mean, it's a very different market. Obviously, there are challenges linked, linked to the, the differences, but I think the, the, the major one is that for an African company coming from Africa, you come from a market that is quite poor and dry from a funding standpoint, at least an alternative of funding and opportunity standpoint to a market that is way richer by a factor often of 50 to 100 uh, times mm. uh, 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 bigger. So that gives you a way deeper pool of money to tap into once you have uh, uh, a rationale uh, uh, and investment thesis that makes sense from, from a European investor standpoint. Thank you. Yeah, super insightful points. Um, Cedric, when we were chatting to you, and thank you, Khalid, for that, uh, we'll come back to you just now and, and unpack some more of what you said. Um, Cedric, uh, when we were chatting to you earlier, you mentioned that actually maybe it'll be an easier to bridge from Europe to Africa. And would you like to care to unpack that a bit more? Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, you know, uh, you, Europe is a kind of saturated market or, or, or already. Uh, it doesn't mean that the, 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 there's no opportunity in, in Europe, but compared to Africa, the, you know, there are so so many things to be done or, uh, uh, on the continent. Mm -hmm. uh, from our own experience, you know, building uh, WeCash, you know, um, 
when you look at uh, our, our tech company like uh, Stripe or any other payment gateway in, in, in Europe, you know, uh, you put in your your siren number, then automatically the info grab where you can check if the company exists. Like these are some of the, the, the things that are, that, are, that are already automated. And that makes it easy to, to, to launch a business. But when you go to Africa, there's not, nothing like that. So you need to build it by your own. So you want to, to create a payment gateway. You end up creating uh, a, a, an AML, counterterrorism financing uh, uh, database and, and screening system. Then you end up uh, 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 creating a database for uh, for for checking where the company are located. You end up uh, building a KYC system, etc. These are these are separated startups already. So uh, there are so so many uh, opportunities like like this on the continent that makes it easy for an, a European company to jump into Africa and then uh, maybe focus on one of these key issues. Than for an African to uh, company to uh, to move to Europe, but uh, all these challenges to me are like uh, big opportunities because uh, it it it, uh, it makes like African companies become more resilient. I really believe that if an, if a company survive on the context of Africa, you know, Europe is just a highway. So I really encourage uh, all the African companies to stop thinking small, like, you know, uh, I'm a Cameroonian company or Senegalese company, so I'll just serve my people in my, in, in my community. And then, no, mm. let, let's think big. Let's think Pan-African first. And, you know, I, I, I sit here in Marseille. Mar Marseille is where Europe finishes and where Africa starts. So it's the bridge uh, uh, between these, these two continents. So African companies should, should see Europe as, like next, uh, as an extension of Africa. So let's think about Africa's 1.4 billion people plus 500 additional uh, million uh, people. So it, it, it close to 2 billion uh, uh, um, uh, user uh, market. So it, it, it's doable. I, I, I dream about it and, and I believe it's 100 percent doable. So yeah. Amazing. Thank you, Cedric. Your, your passion is uh, awesome. I feel it all the way from here in Cape Town. Um, I mean, you raise it, I think you hit the nail on the head is that stuff, you know, a lot of Africans, we, uh, one of our good friends did a talk about this, but, you know, we suffer from Africanism and it's exactly that, you know, we think smaller than we could. I mean, and, and, and the amount of the challenges that, that uh, young entrepreneurs on this continent are solving is unbelievable, you know, because we've got real problems and governments are not stepping in. Um, what we have found often, and Elodie, I'm going to come to you here, is, um, you know, where especially when bringing corporate and, and a partnership innovations or, or building, creating a bridge or, or creating a soft landing for African startups to, to be able to grow and, and, and be, not, not be, a, be, be a success story as opposed to something that was a great attempt and, and nothing really came of it. What, what tips and tricks or what have you guys learned from your years of doing this in, in creating a soft landing and fostering relationships? Because I think relationships are super key. And how have you managed to get it right? And, and what, have been, what are some of the lessons that you guys have learned doing what you do? Um, I think, first of all, um, we try to remain very humble at BPI France because uh, we, are, uh, we are the French sovereign wealth fund. We know very well our home market, which is France. Uh, however, mm -hmm. we've been investing in, uh, in the private equity market in Africa uh, uh, for the past almost 20 years. And, and, and we don't have the, the human resources and the know-how to, to, to invest directly into startups and to, and to companies uh, in Africa. That's why since the beginning we've, uh, we've, uh, we've found uh, uh, reliable partners like uh, Africa Invest and Khaled <laughs> uh, to, 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 to enable us to, to, um, to, um, to, to touch the, 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 the huge potential of, of African startups and, and, uh, and, and SMEs. So what has been key for us is to find the, the right fund managers, African fund managers with local uh, network, local understanding, but also um, not only local um, uh, network and understanding, but also um, um, uh, network in, in the rest of the world, notably in, in France and in Europe. And that's why as, as far as uh, when we invest into, into um, African venture funds, uh, we like to, to find teams uh, that have this kind of double culture. Um, I'm thinking, of course, about uh, Partec Africa. We're an investor in them. Mm. 
So initially, there was Patek, that was a, a historical, uh, we've been a historical investor in, in Patek uh, through their French uh, funds. And, and, and when they decided to, to create that, uh, that African uh, cluster, uh, of course, uh, we, we were uh, kind of reassured and, and happy to, to see that, uh, that link that could be made between, between France and, and Africa. And same goes for, for Africa Invest that, that, uh, that uh, is raising its first uh, uh, venture fund. Uh, and, and that teamed up, with Khaled, you will say better than I do, uh, with the with French Chinese uh, GP. And, and we, see, we already see the first uh, results uh, uh, and the, the first deals in the pipeline. I mean, they speak for, 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 for themselves in, in terms of that uh, key links that have been created between, between France, I mean, Europe, and and, uh, and and Africa, and rest of the world as well. Yeah, perfect. And I think, um, Khalid, I'll, I'll maybe just because she kind of, let's just pick up from that. Learn, what have been some of the successes that you've learned in that? I mean, if you could kind of share, pick up on where um, Elodie has, has left off, you know, what, what have you guys learned in, in that early success? I mean, listen. We th this is our se second fund, Elodie, and and between the first and the second, it's been it's been like a period of fifteen years, and and um, and okay, clearly cool. when we started investing into the first fund as well. No, you were in LP in the yes. first fund. <laughs> yes, and uh, and so um, we, we, let's say that that a lot of things has happened uh, uh, in the past fifteen to twenty years in in uh, in, in in Africa. Uh, uh, Ten years ago, uh, most of the African startup that you would find would be African startup that were uh, first incorporated by essentially Africans or from the African diaspora, and second for the African market. That was probably the main use case that you would find for, for, for African startups. In the past five years, there's so many different use cases that been, or, 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 or uh, the typology of companies has been way richer. First, we have a lot of uh, uh, European, uh, uh, American, Asian startups that are coming on the continent that have developed a product that is inclusive on, on the other part of the, of the Mediterranean, decided that basically they need to come south to, de to develop. One of the companies invested in called Hitch is in the mobility space, and this is what basically they've been doing. They've been inclusive in France, then in Belgium, then they went to Morocco, then Côte d'Ivoire and Cameroon, and now and also in, 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 in Nigeria. So that's, 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 um, and that's, that's a, a flow of companies that we see more and more, uh, uh, and that is quite interesting. The, the other way around is also true. We see lots of now companies from Africa uh, uh, landing into other markets, with products that are a bit different. The main vertical where we see this right now is B2B software, uh, and essentially SaaS. Basically, right. there are lots of companies. A bit into AI. Uh, remember, one of the opportunities that we have in Africa is that the AI HR market is way less competitive than in, in, in Europe right now. And, and this is a pool of inhabitants it's of 1.3 billion. If you take the top 1% of this, they probably have the same level uh, as, as what we find in, in, in Europe. That's one of the reasons why Google has opened uh, uh, a research center in, in, in Accra, Facebook in, in, in Lagos, and, and more is coming. And so uh, uh, mm. what we've seen in the past five years is critical change in terms of the perception of doing business in Africa on the technology side. And we see also, uh, 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 how would, would I say this, world-class uh, startups that have started studying in Africa and fundraising now in the US, in Europe, and also in China. Uh, and I think this is, these are ex very rich examples of what is happening currently on the continent, and things are, are, are moving at a very fast pace. And we've seen, for instance, funding on the continent for the past six to seven years uh, that has been increased by 46% to 50% a year, uh, and doubling last year. Uh, uh, and I think that's, that's, that's quite amazing. So. Of course, with this current year, we don't know what will happen in this particular 2020, but, but the, the, the trend is there, and I think it's there to last. Yeah, very key spin points. Thank you so much for sharing that. I mean, I think what, you know, what all of you talked about, um, the kind of the golden thread, is, is changing the narrative that you know, traditionally has been found on, on Africa. And I want to come to uh, you, Fatimo, because I know that you, you know, in you know, changing the narrative and the diaspora that's coming out of Africa and about African tech and African ecosystems, and you spoke about, and I know that you're quite excited about creating an ecosystem that is favorable. Would you care to unpack some about that and what have you learned uh, at your time? Yeah, uh, as Gonzinav, we work a lot with a lot of uh, innovation center and. Uh, and technopoles who are most flourishing all over Africa. There's a lot of uh, structural that help and support startups in Africa. And we are 
coordinating a big network called Afrikinav, who, um, which inside Afrikinav there is more than 60 incubators and uh, accelerators programs who help and support startups uh, in Africa. And I think that we have to encourage that kind of, uh, of uh, network because it helps to connect and to bridge the gap between uh, startups in Africa and in France. Also, Bundina really wants to be that kind of actors who help and to connect Europe and African person uh, for to making and to create business uh, between the both continents. And I think that we need to really uh, as an investment or financial way, create a lot of, um, of uh, I don't know how to say that in English, but we need to, 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 to create a favorable ecosystem for the entrepreneurs. Because as an, as, a, as an example, we have a lot of entrepreneurs who came from Africa, for Cameroon as an example. And when they came in Bondinav on in our incubators, they are, the first thing that they are is that they are looking for money and they are going to... To, to go to, for example, to BPI, and and uh, they're coming back to us, and and they told us that, for example, their business is not innovative. They are not a big innovations, so they can have any funds from BPI or that things like that. So the problem is that we need to really uh, communicate in between the ecosystem to be sure that um, what kind of startups are eligible to that kind of fund, for example, and how we can support and help the entrepreneurs who came from Africa. Uh, uh, with the best advice that we can get to them. And uh, I think that we need to, to be more connected and to talk more between the ecosystem to help the entrepreneurs who came from the continent. Totally. And I think, uh, yeah, that's a great, thank you for sharing that. You know, I don't know about you guys, but the one thing that I've really enjoyed about this lockdown COVID time is that I'm actually speaking to people on the phone a lot more. You know, I'm actually picking up the phone and you're having conversations. And I think it's yeah. forced all of us to do that, whether it's by voice or video like we're doing now. And, you know, I think in our tech world, we underestimate the power of just a conversation with someone and go, hey, what are you up to? What are you building? Where do you need help? What are you up to? What are you building? How can I help? Maybe you're referring. And, you know, I think in the end of the day, it also comes back, you know, from what you're saying, you know, it comes back to basics and, and we forget some of the, the simpler things uh, in, in the complex tech world that we all play in. Um, guys, I'm going to go into uh, Q&A and just, ask, you know, so guys who are watching in um, from all over, feel free to ask a question and we'll probably just only have about five minutes of this. Maybe we only get it one or two and I'm sorry, but we got to get onto the pitches. But um, one of the questions was, uh, when do we know is the right time to expand into markets outside of Africa? Uh, I'm, I'm sure, obviously, you know, it depends on which particular markets. I assume we're talking, um, this is from Umba. I'm sure, I assume we're talking about Europe specifically here. And, and maybe what we'll do is, Cedric, we'll have a quick uh, answer from you. And then um, Elodie uh, or Khalid will have a quick answer from you or, or Fatima too, if you like as well. Um, just a quick answer. When, when is the right time to expand? Uh, I, I would say uh, uh, it'd be shocking, but African companies first focus on Africa. There are so many things to be done. There are so, so many things. You will not have time to go to Europe, you know. Uh, if you start yeah. solving the issue in Cameroon, then you move to South Africa, Kenya, you know, and Nigeria. Yeah, Nigeria, it's uh, uh, at its own, it's a continent already. So you will, yeah, not, yeah, yeah. you will never have time to go to Europe. So focus on your market first grow big inside and uh, maybe uh, give, given, the, given the opportunities that will, be, that will come to you, you you just end up in Europe maybe, but focus on Africa, it's already a big market to, to, to acquire. Thanks, Ed. anyone else care to add to that? Yeah. I think uh, it, it really depends on, 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 on the rationale of, of, uh, of going to Europe. Um, if it's for, for, for fundraising, which makes a lot of sense, huh? um, I think it has to be very early on. It's very important to diversify its, uh, its, uh, its investor base with European investors. And, and the, the, the earlier, the better. I'm not saying that it's easy, but, but if you do it early, you have chances that basically you, you, you keep that trend going on uh, uh, along the life uh, of the, the different cycles and, uh, and rounds of, uh, of investment of your, of, your, of your company. If it's for markets, like Sajid was saying, uh, I think it has to be only at late stages. You really need to stabilize your operations and your, your PNL. Uh, uh, first in, in the African markets where, where you're already present. And remember, Africa is 54 countries. So, so you have so much to do first in Africa. Uh, but I've seen companies at an early stage that have succeeded doing it. A company called Hotel Online, for instance, in, um, in, in Kenya, 
uh, with an interesting product that is a mix of SaaS and services for small hotels. They've been successfully going into, into, into Europe at an early stage, uh, but this was a mix of, of European and African uh, founders. So they had, they had both knowledge, I would say, in the, in, the, right. in the mix. So it's really a matter of, of taking this as a pragmatic approach, but, but for the market standpoint, I definitely would suggest that at a late stage. Awesome. Thanks, Khalid. Uh, ladies, do you want to chime in uh, anything else after that before we move on to the next question? You good? Cool. Um, okay, well, I think we'll do, let's see what the boss Leo says. I think we'll do one more um, and then we'll jump into the pitch session. So guys, uh, panelists, uh, get ready to have your one straight fire question ready or two or three that you can ask the, the guys who are pitching. Um, there's a question here from PP. There are, there are tech cuts, some tech companies in Africa that have expanded to Europe and the third experience is like going from big fish in a small pond to being small fish in a big pond. What can be done to prepare this drastic change? Any of you guys want to jump in on that? Uh, I'll, I'll give it a try. <laughs> Not a simple one. Okay. Uh, but uh, I don't think the objective is to become a, a, a big fish in a, in a, in a big pond is, is the only objective. But, uh, but another way to, to look at it is, is really a matter of, of finding your way into, into a, probably a, a bigger maze. Uh, this is the way we describe the, the European and probably French uh, ecosystem. And, and, and for this, you, 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 need, you need to build your network. Building your network is by maybe hiring the right people in, those, in that market. Uh, getting also on board the right the right investors. I think uh, BPI has built one of the best ecosystem ever in, on the on the on the funding side in the past 20 years. Uh, um, and so you have yes, you have a very good network through uh, through LOD. So don't 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 hesitate to reach out. Um, and uh, and uh, and also trying to get good 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 investor on board. I mean this is this is uh, this is probably the uh, the first step that you would take if you want to to go into that uh, that market. Thanks, Khalid. Uh, LOD, can't just share your email address? I'm kidding. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure you'll have a lot of a lot of inboxes soon. Um, it's true, and I think it's also a mindset thing. You know, it, I think what you said was right. Maybe the question, maybe the question's wrong around. You know, are you is the goal to be a bigger fish in a big pond? You know, uh, it, it depends on what your driving agenda is. Um, okay, guys, let's get stuck in. We've got or more. I want to see how we've got five amazing um, startups who are going to be pitching. They have basically four minutes to pitch four minutes to answer questions so they'll do a very quick pitch in four minutes that is going to be timed by my trusty time over here and then they'll have four minutes to do a Q&A guys we're going to ask all of you to try and stick to the time and when you do a Q&A try ask a question that is uh, just one more specific and um, and first up without further ado so I think some of you guys might have to drop off just to um, your video just so we can have the pitch join uh, so first up, we've got Achille Labs, and the CEO is Charles Fall. Charles, are you with us? Hi, guys. And yes, I am. Charles, you made it. We, the whole world was resting on you, showing your video. We were just, you know, worried there for a second. Yeah, so, uh, all the permissions you have to the video. Exactly. Do you accept the terms and conditions? I do. Okay. Um, Fantastic. Welcome, Charles. We look forward to hearing what you've got to say. Panelists, uh, have a pen and paper ready. And if you have a question, we're going to ask some questions straight afterwards. So, uh, Mr. Charles, are you ready? Um, do we need slides? I believe we're going to be showing, are you showing the slides, Leo? Yeah. There we go. All right. Fantastic. Okay, cool. Everyone got you. Right. Charles, uh, good luck, my buddy. Your time starts now. Yeah, thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Charles Fall, the founder and CEO of Achille Labs. Achille Labs is a medical device company focusing on point of care medical diagnostics and specifically molecular diagnostics. And for those of you who don't know, that's RNA and DNA diagnostics. We've got the partners that you can see there. This is to ensure that we can get through the technical process of technology development, product development and deployment correctly. Our team currently consists of myself, uh, CEO, and also biotechnologist and experience in diagnostics, Lucas Slaughter, our COO, and also a bi uh, biotechnologist with in vitro assay development experience, and then our CMO, our chief medical officer, Dr. Farhan Pervius, who couldn't join us, unfortunate, unfortunately, who is an expert in respiratory illnesses and also a diagnostic expert in the field. So the, currently, the problem is that 
there's a huge requirement and need for diagnostics. Over 75% of medical decisions in the USA, for instance, are made based on diagnostics. However, in Africa, it's less than 5%. So this results in unnecessary deaths from influenza AB, HIV, SARS-CoV-2 now as well. And this primarily occurs due to the lack of early detection. Long turnaround times, which we believe that we can fight and prevent through our system, which is MobiMed. And I shall show you guys some more about it now. So our solution looks like that. It is a relatively small device, uh, smaller than a shoebox, that analyzes five samples at a time. And this can either look for HIV, influenza AB, or SARS-CoV-2 that we're working on at the moment. And this device does not need external power. It is powered by, by battery and can do a certain number of assays before it needs a recharge. And we believe that this decentralization of healthcare is the way forward in order to prevent unnecessary deaths from a lack of diagnostics. So in Africa alone, over 12 million people die each year due to a lack of diagnostics. And of those, 2 million are directly preventable with simple treatments if there were diagnostics. So we're looking to approach and solve that problem in Africa, followed by going into the EU and focusing on genetic markets and infectious disease. And then subsequently to that is Asia and America, where we believe that our following of the FDA process and CE process will allow us to expand into these markets easier than other companies who technically would not follow those processes due to either cost or lack of understanding in those fields. Our current timeline is for the next eight months that we want to raise 1.5 to 2 million US dollars in order to conclude our technical feasibility create our complete integrated platform, which goes from DNA extraction to output. And then that'll allow us to position ourselves for our next steps, which is 510K approval from FDA and market validation. One minute. And we've collected the correct partners to do this. TTP for hardware, New England Biolabs for assay development, and ourselves to bring everything together and clinical assessments and trials. We also have a very strong clinical partner with over 185 facilities throughout South Africa alone, which is NetCare. Our scientific advisory board is, as you can see there, and it also includes Professor Michael Levitt, who is a Nobel laureate from Stanford University. Thank you very much for listening to me, and I hope it was informative. Charles, thank you. That was amazing. It's amazing what you guys have cooked up in the basements of Achilles. That's incredible. Super inspiring. Well done. Um, any panelists? Do you have guys have any questions? Anyone? 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 Otherwise, I've got one. Yep, I have a question. Um, so thank you so much for for this great presentation, uh, Charles. Uh, it's, it's it's amazing. Uh, I just I just have a question about your your market size. Uh, why going to Europe, uh, where the you know the the health system is 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 that advanced? uh you know uh, people have uh health coverage so they go to the hospital it is free they will get diagnosed etc etc why targeting europe and not only focusing on the big market of africa uh so i think there's a severe misunderstanding when it comes to that in africa we, a lot of the time we use palliative care so we treat things that are already existing that haven't been diagnosed we try and make the patients comfortable with what resources we can However, in Europe, it's more now become an approach of either precision medicine, which is focused on a patient, their genetics and how their disease can be prevented. And this all comes down to preventative healthcare. So that is looking for genetic markets such as the BRCA gene in females that are potentially predisposed to breast cancer, which allows them to take measures in order to prevent getting sick. And that's becoming more of a stronger approach, especially with the i would say the crusade into precision medicine and this has become very clear with our visit last year to darmstadt in D germany with merck as well where we extensively discussed this with clinical experts um, and epidemiologists from merck okay anyone else okay um i got one for you charles um where do you see the application of the technology um, on other diagnostic fields? So for other diagnostic fields, this can be expanded. So for instance, with the genetics, genetic markers, and even in drug development, 
it can be applied and used for things such as gene expression studies. So it has a broad application across anything that is either RNA or DNA based, which means that anything that happens within your body that is associated with a protein or any disease that is genetically associated or RNA, DNA associated. Um, and then we've got one from the panel here. Are there any technology risks in the development of the Acculabs product? And is it still in development or is there proof of concept? So we've got proof of concept that we're busy with. We actually just busy building our new laboratory. Um, and we do actually have a prototype as well. Sorry, I'll just answer that while I'm at it. Uh, so the execution risk on this, on a medical device company is always more about how, how do you bring everything together? You're working with biology and hardware and you've got to bring those two things together and then you also have software sitting in the middle that analyzes everything and gives you a result. That's why we've established the correct partners in order to do this. Going at this alone can be very daunting and I would not advise it for medical device companies. Getting the correct partners in place, such as TTP and New England Biolabs, are essential to making something like this as low risk as possible for us and for investors that potentially join us. Amazing. Guys, uh, thank you so much. Uh, anyone else got a last question before we wrap up? I was curious to know what's going to be the price of your um, it's, uh, developed. So our current main competitors would be something like Cobias Liet or Cepheid um, or the Gene Expert system. Those are between $10,000 to $14,000 per unit. Uh, our unit, due to the chemistry that we use, is $500 at the moment um, in construction cost. Then beyond that, the assay itself um, is around about $10 what we're aiming for. And that's currently, if you're looking at competitors, the gene expert is between, depending on which test it is, is between 10 to $19. So we've got an offset in device cost, which also means that we could potentially then go on a different model where we provide the device for free to clinician and they buy the consumables for us to continually use the system. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Brings us to the end of Charles. We're fantastic. Well done. Thanks for uh, opening up the stage. Big Thank shoes to follow. Much. Good luck with your endeavors. We hope to uh, see you soon. Next up, we have Go Metro, and they are represented by Bob Cabea, who heads up the Francophone market. Bob, you reveal yourself. Going for Bob. Bob, come in. Otherwise, if Bob's not run. Ah, oh, there's Bob. Fantastic. We almost lost you there. We almost went on. You got to be quick, guys. This is a rapid fire thing. You know, okay. time is money. Let's yeah. go. Let's go. Yeah, the yeah the stage has been full. That's why. <laughs> that's how I was not able to share my screen. Bob, welcome. That looks great. Thank you. Are Thank you, you. Thank you. Are you ready? We're going to hear all about Go Metro and the amazing things that you do. So when you're ready, just uh, let me know, and we'll kick off the uh, the timer of death. Huh? Or success. Okay, no, I think I think we can start then. We can start. Okay, Bob, over to you. Let's go. Yes. Uh, bonjour. Uh, good. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Bob Cabea, and I'm the head of Francophone and African market at Gometro. Gometro is a transport tech company that is at the intersection of transport and technology. So we have a team that is a blend of transportation planner and that has been working on solving urban mobility problem. As you may know, urban mobility is a problem that is affecting everybody. At this stage, you have more than 4 billion people that are living in cities. Transport is changing. Transport is under pressure and underfunded. But this is which challenge And in the next 10 years, the situation in terms of urban mobility is prone to change. And for that, we need to understand what is transport. Transport is a blend of assets, labor, and fuel. In terms of assets, you see your vehicle, labor, you see your driver, and fuel, you see it as the, as the cost. And we've developed a recipe that literally combines those three factors and find ways of optimizing that in order to improve and reduce these factors and reduce cost overall that people are actually experiencing on a daily basis. And that recipe is this. It's a, that, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a combination of various software that we've developed that we use 
through three stage model and three steps in order to provide urban urban mobility solution. The first step to our solution is called the measure, where we collect demand data and current operation. We try to understand how operations are. We've collected so far up to 1 million kilometer in taxi data in Cape Town, Johannesburg, Kinshasa, Kigali, Guadalajara in Mexico, and Austin in the US. The second step is modeling, where we actually try to improve on the asset labor of fuel and make sure that the revenue is maintained for the operator. And all of that works toward us generating subscription revenue through our manage and move app. So the, our project to platform business model works in, in this way that our measure and model, we generate project fees and our manage solution, we generate license fees. We are talking about our, our group financial at this stage. We've gone through a phase where we've had 100% revenue growth year on for the past three years. And right now in 2020, in 2020 despite COVID-19, we've managed to actually generate $2.5 million in revenue. And we've been using most of that to actually fund our uh, Latin America expansion and growth, and also continue with our product development at this stage. And we are present in South Africa, in Argentina, Buenos Aires, in New York, and in the UK. And that was one of the reasons why we actually wanted to expand a bit more in Africa because of Brexit. Some of our clients are seen in this slide, and our funding request right now is $2 million in order for us to do our expansion, international expansion in Europe. We want to actually open an office in France to take advantage of the French mobility orientation law, increase our sales, and do a lot more networking in the, fran uh, in the francophone environment. And that's about it in terms of the ask that you actually currently have. I think my time is about... Yes, uh, thank you. Brilliant. That's about the... Thanks, Bob. That was fantastic. It's great to see what you guys are doing. Uh, you've done an amazing job in 2020 already. So you've obviously COVID is you sidestep COVID quickly. Okay, sort coming. Um, guys, do, who has some questions that you'd like to throw at Bob? Any of you guys? Yeah, I have one question. How did you choose the countries in which you want to set up in the first place? You are in America, in Latin America, in Europe, in Africa. What was uh, this? So. So what happened is, uh, was uh, based on the solution that you're trying to provide in terms of mobility, we started getting more clients. So we first started working with the World Bank in Africa, and they realized that the problem that we solved in Africa were similar problems that were happening in Latin America and in some part of the, the US. And moving from actually going from project to project, we actually ended up realizing that it was gonna be much easier for us to open offices in those area and have presence in order to be closer to our clients and provide those solutions. So it, it has been more based on project and demand and also realizing in Europe at this stage, in the UK, we had been working with a lot of bus operators that had problem with optimizing the operation. And we realized that the same problem is actually currently present in many of the European countries. That's, what, that's what's driving us at this stage to actually move towards Europe. Thanks, Bob. Anyone else? Yeah. Um. Thank you so much for the brilliant presentation. You know, I I know that that mobility issue is is, is a huge issue, uh, not only in, in in Africa but mostly in Africa. Uh, uh, and then my question is, why is I understand the fact that you know you're following opportunities, uh, but I, I think um, uh, why why don't you focus on like on, on countries like Nigeria? You know, I I, I used to spend five hours to move from, from Yaba to Marina Land in, 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 in the city of Lagos, in the same city where you have like millions of people that are facing the same issue every day, burning, you know, fuel, et cetera. But don't you think that a market like that deserves more of your energy uh, at, at first before you expand to, uh, to, to the rest? We've been we've been actually we've been focusing on various markets in Africa and responding to some of those issues. But uh, what you need to actually uh, see is that in mobility you have the infrastructure as one of the factors that you need to take into consideration. So the level of infrastructure that you actually find in a specific city affects 
what technology and I think what solution you can actually provide in terms of mobility. So in, in the African context, in many of the places, we've actually only done, uh, we've done a lot of the first part of, uh, of our service offering, which is the major part where we actually collect the data because many decisions are not done properly in Africa because of the lack of data. So we provide uh, stakeholder, we provide uh, transport planner, we provide cities with enough data on the operation and on the minibus taxi as an example. And the example I gave in terms of Kinshasa, when we needed to do the project in Kinshasa, we could not even get a single list from the city of all the routes that are operating in Kinshasa. So in places like that, we actually go there, we try to digitize all the operation to give them a first step so that with the infrastructure changes, we are able to actually move towards modeling and managing the operation. But in Europe, the, the, the situation is different. You have infrastructure that are in a better condition. But for example, bus operation have been, have been using probably different uh, different software, but not necessarily optimized for how things are changing. So for example, uh, recently in Buenos Aires, we had to actually redesign how all the bus operating, uh, all the bus operating company needed to respond to COVID-19 situation because they have that fleet that's present that has been operating for the past 20 years, but necessarily not going to be having the same demand as before. How do they become resilient and how do they adapt to such situation. So that's why different market, we are responding to different question based on the, 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 the place they find themselves in the growth, in the growth curve, if I can say. Okay, thank you. A, a quick thanks, question. Thanks, Bob. Bob yeah, uh, Khalid. Just to understand, who are your clients? I, because you, you, uh, you said that you, 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 are, you are serving bus operators. Are, are they essentially bus operators? Because I've seen somebody in the, in the notes and the chat saying that they've been using it. So you have also a B2C approach. I mean, what is your strategy and, and, who, and who do you serve exactly and, and, and how? So we have, uh, we, we have both a B2C and B2B approach. So on one side, depending on the city, we work with uh, development banks. We have the World Bank, we have AFD, we, we have on uh, the, 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 the layer next to that, we have uh, your consultant like Kistra, your consultant like Kistra and Transit Tech, who usually have projects, who are involved in BRT type of project in Africa, and we collect the data for them. But on the other side, on our mobility and move app, we actually serve it to the customer. But on our model platform, we use, we use our digital platform to give it as a tool to bus operator in order for them to improve their operation. So Thanks, it depends Bob, on- you... Sorry, I must cut you off there to keep it uh, fair to everyone. But uh, if you want to continue chatting, you feel free to answer questions in the chat. Uh, sure. You can type away. Right. Okay. Sorry, Elodie, you might have had a question there. Sorry, we're going to have to circle back to you. If that's okay. This will be. Um, okay, next up. Bob, well done. That was brilliant, man. Um, we have uh, no stranger to the Africa Arena team or Africa Arena ecosystem is Antoine from Clean Chatbot who've been doing some really cool stuff. Uh, we saw them a couple of years ago and I know that they signed a great deal. And Antoine, voila. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Where are you coming in from? Where are you uh, seated to? Are you drove the world? I'm, no. I'm in the middle of a safari house. Nice, sweet. Cool, so yeah. making sure you weren't coming at the space station and there's been some transport up there too recently. Brilliant. Yeah. Antoine, are you ready? Do you have some slides? Uh, yes, I do. Let me put them up. Uh, just to, can you confirm you can see them? Yes, we've got you. Okay, Antoine, if you're ready, your four minutes start now. Super. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Antoine. I'm the co-founder and CEO of FinChatBot, a South African startup based in Johannesburg. A little bit about uh, us, uh, why we're doing what we're doing. We believe in improving people's lives through intelligent digital solution. How do we do that? By ingeniously digitalize and enhance customer experiences. And what do we do is create AI powered conversational agent or chatbot uh, specifically for the financial industry. And our five years strategic vision is to become the world leading enabler of the distribution of financial product through uh, conversational AI. 
The problem that we've identified really two sides. One side is on the financial industry, low conversion rate from digital distribution channels, low product differentiation, and obviously really high cost to run a human center. And from the end customer point of view, 62% of customers prefer to interact with brands via chat over any other channel. Customers expect brands to be available 24 seven and 82% of customers expect immediate response when it comes to sale. So if the process is lead capture on a lead form and call center calls back uh, within uh, 24, 48 hours, you lose the opportunity of selling the product. The people would already look at other instant solution. And that's what we, that's how we come in. We design AI powered conversational agents, uh, delivering exceptional user experience to help our financial service providers to acquire and service customer while bringing costs down. So three core solutions, we don't do more, uh, three that we do very well, end-to-end -end sales process, customer care and collection uh, or retention of customers. Uh, our revenue model is in twofold. One is a licensing model, depending on the package that the client uh, wants to choose, which uh, help us to create an option upsell capability quite quickly. And the big opportunity we see is called the performance-based revenue. So positioning the solution as a broker agent, so an insurance or financial services broker agent, and getting the commission on every single sale of insurance policy. So really a uh, high scalability capability. Uh, market opportunity, just in South Africa, we believe we can become a $50 million uh, revenue uh, in the next four to five years. There is a much bigger opportunity from uh, um, developed countries, uh, around $5 billion. Uh, and that is a combination between uh, a chatbot market that reaches uh, $16 billion in 2024 and this share of every single uh, policy sold uh, by the tool which we, we, um, we envision at sitting around $5 trillion globally as a market opportunity uh, from this sector. Uh, you know, in, in terms of competitive landscape, there's not so many players that have this high integration capability we, we do and high industry specialization that brings so much more value to create, manage and maintain the different product that we put together uh, in order to have the best value and return on investment for our clients. Speaking of them, this is the portfolio of clients we have uh, locally in South Africa. Um, what you can see is the uh, like of MTN, APSA, uh, Telejur, uh, Hollard have all operations um, um, uh, elsewhere in the world. We combine a net promoter score of about 8.6, uh, so quite um, uh, quite positive. An average of 21% conversion rate of the use of our tool without uh, with the solution and without about 13% average. So quite an uptake on the real uh, customer experience value. And four minutes average time to close a sale when um, an agent on a call center takes up to 20 minutes. Um, sorry about that. Uh, we managed to achieve over the past eight months uh, 2.5 uh, contract value uh, growth, 150% more clients, 2.6 times 10 seconds cool, and a growth of monthly recurring revenue. Uh, our objective is to partner up with the like of RPA businesses and consulting to grow in Europe and use our portfolio of clients. Thank you. And our team. <laughs> I wanted to mention the team. Okay, do you have any questions? Uh, yeah, rapid fire here, guys. It's we we're, we're strict. This is like lockdown no regulations, right down. You know what I mean? We're sure. running a tight ship here. Right, guys. Who's got questions? Anyone got questions? Questions? LOD, you didn't have your chance last time. Is it Buzera? LOD. Yeah, we've lost LOD. Maybe she'll come back. Um, or maybe she, yeah, maybe the team people one. Cool, Cedric. Yeah, uh, um, Antoine, what you're doing, man, is uh, uh, amazing. You know, I'm. Um, Thank you. Uh, I, I'm the CEO of a fintech company, and uh, this is one of the biggest issues that we have been facing during the last five years. The demand that we received is so high. People want our product like hell, but we were unable to to deliver and make sure that all of them are satisfied. So this is it's a big, it's a really big opportunity. So now I need to know. Uh, I want to know if if you you have like apis to make sure that the people will be on board through your channels uh, always end up through um, uh, in our databases or, or things like that and how do you manage 
all these data given uh, uh, the, the GDPR, you know, for example, we are a French company, uh, we'll be collecting uh, data for people all over the world, etc. And how do you deal with that? How do you push data to, the, to your client system? How do you deal with the GDPR? Yeah, very good question. So one of our key strategies is to uh, multiply the number of integrations uh, and being able to have a one-stop solution that integrates data provider, backend system, and our conversational capability. Um, so we can, the target is in the next six to nine months coming to a new insurance company or financial institution and say, listen, we have your backend system, your CRM, like Salesforce. We have different payment gateways available and we have a provider that can, that can push the data. Meaning the bot, the solution can be live in the next 10 days. Would you like to operate with us? Uh, so that's nice. really the, the vision we have is becoming um, a platform that has so many different integration into very renowned systems that are used globally, that we can expand globally with this knowledge already acquired. So that's, that's kind of the strategy we have. And do you plan to have APIs, uh, open APIs, so other people can plug into you? Um, we are discussing, but we haven't planned this in the roadmap currently. Uh, but it's it's obviously possible. Uh, our our system is API driven, but we like okay. for now really fine tuning our solution to make sure we are always first time right with any of our new clients. Okay, excellent. Good job, man. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Anyone else? I'm, I'm back. I just had some technical issue. Um, I was curious about uh, about competition because uh, um, obviously um, the AI sector plus the chatbot uh, subsector is uh, is one that, uh, that that we've seen uh, in the in the in the pipeline or in the portfolios of some of the venture funds that we've uh, we've been accompanying for the past few years. So I was just curious to know about competition and how you differentiate. Uh, very good question. Thank you for asking this. So a couple of elements. The first, first is our level of expertise. We are not generalists. We don't work with e-commerce businesses, with uh, flower, with we really about financial institution. And the whole board that I couldn't show the slides, sorry about that. Um, but we all come from this uh, industry, financial service providers, from owner of call centers to uh, digital marketing, to having shares in different insurance companies. So we know the struggle of those companies. And our vision is not necessarily to be positioned as a chatbot provider, but as a conversion provider. Tomorrow, we'll be able to say that our conversion rate is so much higher than any other human agent that they don't even gonna look at, at the technology itself, but considering us as an automated broker agent. And this is so much more powerful than saying, we're gonna do your FAQ on the chatbot. The idea is we impact directly the bottom line. We bring revenue, more revenue than ever before. And that's, that's where we're going. So that's the key differentiation, the integration capability, multi-platform, and the data science and anal analytics that we put together apply to financial institution in the context of selling, servicing financial products. And that's our key differentiator. But I could, I could extend that conversation offline if you want. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, Anton, just one from my side is, yes. um, or from one of the, the guys here, we've got a few seconds, is Sebastian asks, isn't the chatbot industry a red ocean now? Um, what are your things? Um, what are your thoughts? So I, I relate to the, the, the question around competition. I think for me, chatbot technologies are becoming a commodity. Anyone can build a chatbot, drag and drop, putting, a, putting something together. But the real understanding of customer interaction and challenges of integrating different backend systems, legacy systems, that's where you get the most, um, the best results from, uh, uh, from a chat experience point of view is when you have the right level of integration and you don't just answer to one specific query, but you provide the full end-to-end -end experience. Uh, and that's where it, it's becoming powerful. And maybe a quick Brilliant. final I, note, I, if I five can. Five seconds. 
five seconds, that's perfect. We're working on a fantastic um, approach to tackle uh, the African continent with a local dialect understood by the solution. So that's for us one of the biggest opportunity, um, engaging in local languages, educating people on how is it important to open a bank account or uh, get insured, and we impact directly financial inclusion. And I'm done. Dropping Thanks, the mic. Thank Thanks, you again. Oh, I was about to meet you. You're about to be ejected from there. Your seat through the roof. Okay, guys, that was brilliant. Um, if you guys want to chat to Antoine, feel free to uh, do so offline or on the chat. Merci beaucoup, Antoine. Uh, very impressive. Well done. Nice presentation. Okay, next up we have from Code Allen. Uh, Eloho Thomas. Eloho. Hello, Eloho. Is she there? Yeah, coming up. Can you see me? I'll give it three seconds. If not, then we will move on and try. Can you see me? Ah. Oh. Yay! <laughs> cool. Where are you I, joining us from today? Currently, I am in Lagos, Nigeria. Lagos, I would day. <laughs> I do, I do well. <laughs> cool, man. Welcome. Thank Thanks. You. I like to see such a big smile on a on a winged Wednesday here. It's cold. <laughs> okay, have you got slides for us? Yes, I have. You just need to share your screen and we yes, can be ready on, to roll. On it. Give me a few minutes. Um, let me know when you can see it, please. Sure. Can you see? Yes. Perfect. So let me know when my time starts. Loading. One minute. Yep. Can you see it? Yes, we got you. Okay, your four minutes starts now. Good luck. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Ella Thomas, CEO of Codeline. And today I'll be sharing with you the Codeline story. Um, my co-founders and I, um, having worked as engineers, we discovered a problem. And the problem is recruiting programmers can be quite a headache. And it takes an average of three months to fill up key tech roles. Ask Esther, the HR at um, Union Bank. Um, during the COVID um, lockdown, she was tasked to um, urgently present software engineers for the tech department. Part of our challenges were where to find skilled programmers, how to verify their quality, and the long time to hire. Thanks to Codeline, we're able to help her hire um, 12 skilled engineers to fill up all our positions within a nick of time. We are solving a global problem, yes, and these are um, a few of our, comp our closest competitors. But don't worry, we know what they have for breakfast. Officer <laughs> is, um, helps companies fill up roles in 26 days. IF, IFS, Upwork and Comment are freelance platforms that connect um, software engineers to remote gigs, while VanHack focuses on relocating engineers abroad. But we are unique in the sense that we have built a cutting edge solution that uh, verifies the coding skills of programmer, thereby reducing the risk of a bad hire by 70%. Our processes are automated, being a SaaS platform, from the point of posting a job for the clients to the point of and placing and hire, reducing the recruitment time from three months to two weeks. And we are thereby cutting down rec recruitment time by a whooping 80%. Our processes are also optimized with a minimum of 90% fee ratio. Currently, we, are, we have operations in um, Ghana, Nigeria, and um, Ivory Coast. Our estimated uh, market, the estimated size of our market is 37 million euro. We build our clients a success fee of 12% commission on the programmer's annual gross salary. This is only paid after placement. Um, so far, we have a database of uh, 9,000 programmers across the francophone and anglophone region who filled 52 um, job positions with a fee ratio of 90%. Okay, these are um, some of our notable clients and partners. To mention a few, we have ST Cloud and Rinto in Paris. We ha currently have our, our engineers from Ivory Coast working on a project with them. Uh, we have one of our engineers from Cameroon working on a project with Wikipedia team as well. And of course, you've heard the success story of Union Bank. Uh, we are looking to raise 1.2 million euro. Um, funds will be put heavily into sales and marketing, both for um, demand side and supply side, um, scaling across Africa and um, Europe, starting with France. Now, you might ask why France? In 2019, um, Port Employ, um, posted a report that 50,000 positions in the IT department were not filled. 
Now we saw this as an opportunity. In uh, February, my co-founder traveled to France for a three weeks intensive uh, market research where he validated the market. We're also glad to announce that we've been accepted into Station F, the biggest startup entity in the world, and they'll be assisting us as we plan to scale to us um, Paris. We'll also be strengthening our staff across sales, operations, and engineering. Meet the team. Um, we started this company because we had found a problem that we have the expertise to solve. And um, as engineers ourselves, we, we have passion for sharing opportunities with other engineers. Together, we have over 25 years experience across sales, software engineering, and recruitment. And today, we are looking for um, partners, individuals, partners, and corporates that believe in our vision as Goodlin and that will be supporting us throughout this journey. Thank you. Amazing. Well done. Congratulations. You're on time. Ladies never mess around, eh? On time. <laughs> I like that. Well done. Thank Congratulations. You. Right. Panelists, panelists, do you have any amazing questions to fire? Hello, anyone? Anyone? I've got one if no one's going to jump in. Um, that was fantastic. Uh, well, actually, let's ask one of the one from the audience first, since uh, that's what we're here to serve. Um, how do you acquire customers, and what is the general profile of the customer that are okay for your remote developers? Okay, so um, I'm not sure if I'm still sharing. No? Okay, no. so we acquire, our cross, we acquire our customers by, of course, direct sales. In Africa, that has been very effective. Um, LinkedIn ads has been also um, effective for us. Um, so we wish us to companies uh, mostly corporate because our model is a B2B model. So for the talent, it's completely free for them to sign up on our platform. Then for the clients, that's where we do, I would say, a huge um, form of um, marketing to reach out to more clients um, for our product. Um, go for it, Sid. Yeah, um, uh, thank you for, for this presentation, uh, which is really, really good. You know, hiring uh, developers on, on our continent is still a very big challenge. I, I, have, I have teams in, in Cameroon, Cote d'Ivoire, and Kenya, and it's, it's, it's still very difficult to find the right developer. So I want to know how do you verify the programmer yeah. skills and how do you deal with the LinkedIn if where someone will uh, learn uh, I don't know, C for four or five days and say I'm a, I'm a, a skyrocker who has worked at SpaceX and NASA, then I landed on the moon. Uh, I said, How do you deal with that? Okay, awesome. So I'd like to mention that we have a very unique team. All of us have a background in engineering. I'm a systems engineer. There's Dexter, is a um, software slash network engineer, Felicia, software engineer, and then um, Dennis is a cyber security engineer. So we come with great expertise, first of all. Then we have been able to build, which I mentioned, a proprietary um, testing platform. So how it works is uh, we test our candidates based on a project-based assess assessment. So they come on our platform. We have our own unique ID, which is monitored. So they, we give them a project to work on, they code, and we analyze it. So we analyze the code based on best standards and practices. What we check for is um, code quality, vulnerability, how it is easy will it be to hack into what they are building, uh, maintainability, how easy will it be to maintain the code that this engineer has written? All of this process is automated. That's um, what we focused on during our first year. Yeah, hey, I wanted to ask you how do you get to make sure it's scalable? Because if you have to verify by yourself. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so ideally, um, for some of our clients, they want us to do the verification process themselves. For most of the clients we've worked for um, outside the country, like I mentioned a few, um, we currently have one of our engineers working with Wikipedia. Um, funny enough, it's from Cameroon, right? So they had their own screening process. So they are, we are like, okay, we've tested, and they're like, mm, don't worry, we still want to do our tests. So other bigger corporates, they have their own processes in place to guarantee that the talent we are sending to them is um, best. Fit. But still, we still do our own due diligence to ensure that the candidates has the technical skills that we afford. Okay. Amazing. Uh, Fatima, too, did you want to jump in? Yeah, uh, I just have one question. Is by like developing in France your activity, you wish to offer to your French consumers uh, engineers for, who are coming from Africa or engineers who are living in France. Uh, what is the, or it is, it is the aim is to promote uh, the talent from Africa to the French consumers. Is this a strategy? Uh, beautiful. So, yes, the aim is our engineers are Africans. Um, we try to target African engineers because, I mean, we are in the market and we have um, a huge community. 
So it's not a challenge for us getting. So our first year of operation, we are focused on the supply side, which is kind of like the approach that uh, I would say our seniors, Airbnb and the likes that have come up with businesses like this have done, right? So we have our talent. That's why we have 9,000 currently. Now, um, for the Francophone regions, we have them mostly across Ivory Coast. So one of my co-founders is um, from Ivory Coast. We have them across Ivory Coast, Senegal, and Cameroon, right? So these three, co these three countries are tech-savvy countries, and they have a huge pool of, of talent. So we are pushing diversity um, across. And if you know, like, um, pushing diversity across to teams and helping um, companies abroad hire engineers, um, and even local companies hire engineers to carry as well. Amazing. Anyone else? Um, I had a question. You said that you know what the, all your competitors eat for breakfast. What makes you guys? Uh, ah, you guys be there. You guys, what makes you guys better? What's in your breakfast? What are you eating? <laughs> okay, I like to say about a goosey soup, but <laughs> not right now. <laughs> okay, so ideally, um, now we had a. a particular strategy when we started. We did a deep market research. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our product is a SaaS product, and we have engineers across 12 African countries currently signed up. Now, for the client side, we're like, okay, fine, what are our strongest competitors and what are they doing and what can we do differently? So we have a form of relationship with the software engineers, which is something that differentiates us. Um, we've come up with a model that is both appealing to the software engineers and the clients themselves. So. To mention one of our notable um, competitor here in, um, in in Lagos, for example, Andela. So on our platform currently, we have a lot of Andela software engineers in our platform, right? So this is because um, these candidates are good, but they've also seen value in the services that we are rendering. So there's no exclusivity to the talent in Africa, as long as we can show that, okay, we can deliver value for, for this talent. So we have a close, uh, a close um, relationship with our community um, across both Anglophone and um, Francophone Africa. Okay. Whilst, made, well, whilst maintaining on time and on budget, hey? Of course. Correct. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> cool. Brilliant. Uh, it's great answers. Thank you, Eleanor, for joining us. Uh, super okay. exciting to see what you do and continuing your stride. It's good to see a female founder kicking butt. <laughs> Keep going. Thank you. Keep going. Thank you. Thank Don't you. undersell yourself. So that you're doing some amazing work. Okay, guys, Thank next, you. last and definitely not least, we have Katsuki from, who is the, um, oh, sorry. Abid uh, Kirani from the uh, company Kaski. Abid. Right, guys, this is the last one. It's been awesome. Everyone who's tuning in, feel free to ask your question. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hi, guys. Abid. Nice to see you. Cool and you, brother. Thank you. How are you doing? Good. Where are you tuning in from today? Um, I'm in Casablanca now, actually. Casablanca, Casablanca Morocco, yeah. Amazing, my man. Yeah. Um, okay, have you got slides to share? You're going to share your screen? Do you, do you see my screen? Not yet. Okay. We all wait with anticipation. It's the in my screen sharing. It's okay. And now. <clears throat> Nothing yet. Nothing yet. Come on. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, let's have a look. Nope. Ah, there we go. Just yeah. a little bit slow. All good. Perfect. Casablanca internet speeds. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I, when I was there, I was like, come on, guys. We can do better than this. Okay. No. Yeah. Um, brilliant. My brother, you're, if you're ready, your yeah, let's go. minute sure. starts let's go. now. Yeah, thanks a lot. So uh, 19 years ago, I have experienced a near-death motor accident and uh, being a two-wheel driver today is to face 21 risks of accidents per kilometer. And as a consequence, 500,000 drivers dies each year. 70% of accidents are caused by invisibility and dangerous behavior. We are solving this worldwide issue by leveraging first the IoT device. We are providing two versions. The first one, the external device, can be attached behind in helmet, acts as a brake light, a third signal, and a warning signal. And the second device, the embedded version, can be plugged inside the motorcycle, track much more data, and those both devices enhance driver's visibility and safety scores behavior, track route quality, share 
uh, real-time data and notifies emergency and family in case of an accident. And the secondly, the mobile application, which coach, assist, and enhance safety. Also, the mobile applications allow to share dangers in real time and incentivize safe driving through signification and pay-as-you-go insurance program. And finally, our mobility as service platform, which converts daily commutes into assets by sharing road dangers, helping city to track road information, and also by incentivizing safe driving behavior. Our big target is to reduce motor accidents by 10% on focusing <coughs> on Africa, and also by saving insurance money, by reducing claims, and in fine, increase the use of the helmet, make it a spontaneous, a spontaneous habit, uh, especially in Africa again, and finally, to reward commuting data. The market is just huge, more than 5.3 billion motorcycles around the world. Kaski has been nominated many, uh, several times. The last one was in TCAD event in Yokohama, Japan. And since then, we have closed our first seed with Kipple Africa Venture. We had also a chance to partner with Allianz, Morocco and provide 10% insurance bonus for two wheel drivers. We are uh, closing a second deal with the second insurance company and providing 20% of insurance bonus. And also, we have become the official partners for road safety of the Moroccan police. We are today present in four cities in Morocco. Kaski is accelerated at Station F Paris, and we did few pilots in Paris with some restaurants. Also, we have been working on many partnerships in Kenya and Nigeria, and we are ready to go as soon as possible. Uh, why we are doing this? We are doing this to extend Kaski in Africa, Europe, and Asia, and we are raising on two rounds during the next eight months. The first one, 500,000 this year, and the, last, the second one, early 20. 21. So we are raising 2 million at the total. We are a personal team, my co founder Saeed, who is PhD on machine learning and IoT, and myself, 19 years on marketing, IT, and lean startups. And seconds. Four, four, part, four personal team members. Uh, so thank you so much for your time. I will be happy to answer any question. Thank you. Amazing. Abid, you knocked it out the park. Thank you so much. Nice, on time. Halala. Okay. Um, brilliant. Who's got questions for Abid? I, I think I had a problem with my camera. <laughs> Sorry, guys. No worries. Uh, Do you see I, me? I yes. Good. Um, Do you guys have any questions? Said it looks like you're rearing to go. <laughs> Bring <laughs> it on, brother. <laughs> uh, could, could you uh, elaborate a little bit? Uh, sorry. Uh, thank you for your your good presentation. You know, saving lives it should be you know the, the the main key reason why we are building technology. So you're you're deep deep diving into that. So thank you, thank you for. Uh, thank for you, that. sir. So, so now now how could you elaborate a little bit, a little bit more on how you make money out of uh, or what you 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 you're building? Yeah. Good. Uh, um, until the beginning of Kaski, we were we was focusing on B two B business. So we provide the IoT device and the the SaaS platform to insurance company who gives for free the device to their customers. This is the first target. In return, customers get bonus insurance bonus, of course, and share data. And in return, we can track the use of the helmet. So as a motor or or scooter driver, you have to wear your helmet. Kaski technology know that the driver had the helmet or not during an accident. This is the big things we we done. Also, in case of accident, the device acts as a black box. So the insurance company can track wow. all these problems. Yeah, absolutely. But at the same time, uh, we you know in Africa, for example, and I, it could be maybe second question in Africa, um, the, the accident is 80 percent. The worldwide accidents are, as you know, uh, 500 thousand person dies each year, 80% of this number is only in Africa. That's why to make the use of the helmet like a spontaneous mandatory, 
you have to talk to the pocket of customers and not of, of, of safety of customers. That's why if you need to get uh, a cheaper insurance, then you have to wear your helmet, you know, and then you need you have to have a good behavior. It's so simple. And this is the key. This is a win-win between insurance and the customers. The second partner we have, we are also a, a solution provider for, uh, for delivery free floating. Today, we are also providing a voice command solution. So as a, a for delivery, you don't need to, to see your phone or your mobile while driving. You just need to order, to get orders over your Bluetooth, to answer, to ask over your Bluetooth, that's it. As a manager, I can just send a text message. We convert a text message over voice, over AI and machine learning, and that's it. We are trying to make commuting safer for both B2B and as soon as possible for B2C. As I told you before, we was focusing on B2B because it's a huge market. That's give us a way to scale up quickly without spending a lot of money on marketing. But we are starting a B2C business by September. We are launching our quick startups also for a new version of products. Yeah. And yeah. today also we are a partner with the city, for example, in Marrakesh, Safi, and uh, Isawira, three cities in Morocco. We provide a smart city solution, so we track road quality over many, many motorcycles, public motorcycles, and we share road quality data with cities. That's a huge business too. Yeah, that that's great. So I, I, I that's wonderful. You know, we I just launched a platform that we call We Care Up to support governments on on with COVID nineteen, and I think your platform could be a, an additional piece to to that. Do you have APIs that you can connect to other other partners? Yes, if yes, I'll be happy to partner with you guys. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thanks a lot, Cedric. Okay. Cool. By the way, we uh, have provide. Yeah, sorry, uh, sorry. Yeah, it's okay, Patrick. Um, look, um, so guys, we've got a question here from Laura. If there's anyone else on the panel that wants to, uh, in Africa, bikers actually don't really have a smartphone to download the app, and 99% don't have insurance. They represent the majority of the market. Um, how do you manage that in your development? No, that's. Uh, I think he talked maybe about Kenya or even if Nigeria, the 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 insurance is is mandatory. You cannot drive a, a bike without insurance. We we had a discussion with uh, with Yamaha with uh, Toyota in Africa because they produce, the manufacture motorcycle in Nigeria. And we know well that the insurance is mandatory in many countries in Africa, maybe a few countries. Even if Lagos, the, the helmets and the insurance is mandatory. Uh, it will be a few exceptions in my opinion. Okay, brilliant. Any, any other, um, how many, um, you may have said this, how many customers do you have currently work on your, uh, currently paying for the platform sorry how many customers do you guys do you currently have today we have exactly three thousand five hundred and we are uh, as i told you we are launching our b2c customers and we are targeting one hundred thousand new customers by early 2021 well from three thousand to a hundred thousand yeah, I mean, yeah exactly we, we are targeting a huge kickstarter uh, kickstarter campaign and also in the google it's in progress. It will be launched by, by September uh, with a new, really new and cool version, more smart with voice command control, with uh, voice uh, road sharing, notification, all this kind of new technology. You can just send order to your device, for example, high cascade, turn left, and then you have the light behind your head. You don't need to have a remote in your bike, motorcycle, and have your device. Just one device with a touchless, and that's it. This is the new feature of mobility. It should be really touchless. Fantastic. Um, really, really impressed, guys. That brings us to the end. Thank you so much for that. I, your your innovation, I mean, the, everyone, everyone's innovation that we've seen today is really impressive, guys. And it just goes to show, you know, I think everyone that's tuned in, thank you so much. We, we like to say the person's time is the greatest gift they can give, and especially to our panelists. Thank you so much for adding your insights. Uh, Fortunately, we lost LOD if she's got technical internet issues. But uh, to the rest of you three, thank you so much for joining us. Um, really, really grateful. And um, guys, so as mentioned, we've got we've got a whole bunch of other events lined up with uh, PPI, and uh, they will be announced on the Africa Arena social channels. Um, if you haven't subscribed to our mailing list on AfricaArena.com, what are you waiting for? You can see from today, and please share it. Please, uh, you know, there's 
I think, you know, it's all up to us to share, to change the narrative of what's happening in Africa and the innovations happening in Africa. And, you know, it, it, it costs absolutely nothing. You can share the newsletters, you can share the posts, you can, you know, uh, share the recordings, you can share the podcasts. There's so much going on um, around what these uh, founders are doing. And so just please, if you, if you come across them, follow the channels. Um, and, and share that. And speaking of feedback is, um, guys, we'll be sending you all a survey. So uh, in your inbox in the next uh, few minutes, there will be a survey just to let us know what you thought, uh, what, what we can do better, what you loved, what we can improve, who was a favorite panelist, um, just so we never invite them back. I'm kidding. Um, and uh, that's, yeah, so we just like to get your feedback. We want to make these better. We want to make these more interactive, more engaging, more fun. And, uh, you know, we do them for you. So everyone that's watching, please just let us know. You'll be getting an email from either Leo or Papa Mai at Africa Arena team. To all of you guys, thanks so much. Have a beautiful Wednesday. Stay tuned to the channels in Africa Arena. And uh, on behalf of uh, Christophe and Leo, merci bien. Uh, bon jeune, bon soirée. And we'll see you guys at the next one. Ciao. Thank you.